dann noch mal in der Bundesrepublik kommen. Well, there's a myriad of things. So I, I think first of all, we have to go back to a writer who um, is very well known for teaching skills. Your students uh, speak a whole lot about you. It's Nigeria competition. I said, you know, let's pick them up, uh, let's take them back to Nigeria, and let's teach them a different kind of job. Hello, nice to have you join us on this special edition of the woman i call it special because every day we on set it is a special day to bring you another special lady you know they say the house is only a house but it can be turned into a home when a woman walks in which is why we've taken time to create this program to ensure that women bring in on board their spice their strength sometimes what you call their weakness but actually that's what makes the world go round that's your lovely tender hands who is my guest today find out after this time out have you ever wondered why some men cannot finish using the towel and just hang it back somewhere in the bathroom <laughs> Why would they have to throw it on the bed? Little things like that, very put up. Have you ever wondered why a grown man with a wife and kids will go to the toilet, the lavatory, to ease himself to do number one, to pee, right? He takes his seat up, flips out that thing. The moment he starts peeing, he flushes the toilet, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> The toilet, the toilet does its own bit. The flushing is done before the pee is done. As oh! Like ten liters of water is wasted. The pee is still there. Oh my goodness! He doesn't put the seat back down. He doesn't reflush. He doesn't wash his hands. He walks away. Ooh. That's why I don't like shaking men, by the way. There's, there's a particular thing we know many men to be very, very guilty of, and that's throwing their shoes and stockings all over. Mm. Um, maybe men are going to be better not throwing it around but they can just it's just something that happens smelly feet and keep it for you in the living room women don't like it it is a woman and we are right on time i'm sure you saw a little bit of my guests she is one woman whose voice has been heard for some time now years now if you ask me around the world of nap tape she is simply known as dame chili oka donley Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. You know, I am tempted to say you look pretty. You look beautiful. But I'm sure you're pretty, you know, used to that. Because the truth is, every day I see you, it, rather than going down, you keep adding. Mm. Let me start by asking, what's the secret? <laughs> I have the most lovely set of teeth. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you so much. I'm blushing. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, I, I don't joke with what I eat, um, meaning I eat very healthy. I drink only water as much as possible. I try not to do soft drinks, sugary drinks, and all of that. And most importantly, I do a lot of exercise. And I think the genes also has a role to play in all of this. <laughs> Definitely. God actually sets it up rolling, and then our own is to do our little bit to perfect it. And I think beyond not joking with what you eat, the other things you've not joked with, the issues around women, I'm going to talk about that. But a lot of people, you know, they see you fight for women in, uh, who are being violated, women who are being trafficked, women, recently we've talked about rape, women who are being raped, but you don't really understand that this passion comes from your career. You're a lawyer. Tell me, what made you study law? As a matter of fact, I've always wanted to study law or journalism, um, but I opted for law at the end of the day. I always um, wanted to fight for justice. I, I like to, I don't like injustice, you know, of any kind. And, um, you know, even when I was in the university, I, I won the moot court competition, the dean's first moot court competition in ABU. That was in 1990 uh, when I graduated. And, you know, since then, I just thought, you know, there's no going back. You know, I'd always wanted to when I was young, really. And I, I just thought it was something that I had to do. That's uh, interesting, and uh, when people, it's good when people know what they're going, what they want, where they're going to, and they actually told their mind, it makes you more fulfilled. But then, that's me assuming, do you think you're satisfied with what you've done? 
Absolutely. I am satisfied with what I've done. As a lawyer, you don't think, you know, one way. You don't think straight. You just think, you know, you have different scenarios. What if, what if you ask yourself questions? You push yourself, you know. So it has, it, it has made me to always think and act outside of the box. And therefore, when you think and, out and act out of the box, you become more learned yes. because you want to know. You know, and then what do you do? You research. And in the process of researching, you're learning more and yeah. more. Yeah, so that's that's the good thing about law. A lot of reading. Yeah. And I know when you were uh, somewhere in the chamber, Anthony uh, yeah. Bene, you did uh, exceptionally well. At a point, so you became the secretary to the state governor. That's Bielsa. Yeah, I was the executive assistant to the Bielsa state governor at the time, Chief Timmy Priscilva. Mm. Yeah, I was his executive assistant for five years. Okay, you want to share that experience with us? Uh, it was a very good experience, you know. I had never really been to Bielsa State. But you're from yeah, Bielsa. I'm from Bielsa, but I've never really been to Bielsa State, you know. And um, when I got to Bielsa, you know, the people there, you know how it is, they, they were seeing it like, this is my state, you know, someone cannot come from outside I got and you. come and get this exalted <laughs> position. So there was a kind of subtle resistance you know on their part um but um at the time they didn't really know who i was where i was coming from they didn't know the family i came from and all of that but um as time went on when they started to when they found out who i was you know where i was coming from and then um, you know they now started relaxing but of course i'm not um, someone to walk over i'm a fighter any day any time uh, yeah, I, I, I stood my <laughs> ground and i said hey you know what the fact that I don't live here doesn't make me a non biosa and I'm a biosa and I have every right and privilege is just like you do. And then the rest is history. And they respected and you worked very well. Of course, I tried to dig in on that uh, a little bit. I got uh, something that I was happy, you know, digging into. When women do well, I feel it's a personal honor to me. And speaking of women, you're also championing uh, the the, the, the course of women who are violated, you know, trafficking, that's the map tip. You know, the women at the helm of affairs. Tell me, you've been there for a while. How has the experience been? I know at a point you told us that you had uh, made uh, about 800 or something cases. Uh, let's share the experience for you. You know, um, map tip was um, solely um, inaugurated or established, rather, um, to fight all forms of human trafficking. But as time went on in 2015, um, the members of the House of Assembly, um, who were very impressed with what they saw NAPTIP do, um, decided that the best place to domicile the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act was in NAPTIP because they were very sure we we're going to do a very good job. And so from 2015, NAPTIP went about um, prosecuting all, all forms of violence against persons. I joined NAPTIP in 2017. And I tell you that from 2017 till date, we've seen so many cases, all sorts of cases, ugly cases, yeah. ranging from domestic violence to rape to incest to all sorts, you know. And trust me, we don't sweep any of the cases under the carpet. Um, painfully, some of the cases of rape, um, they come back to tell you after all the investigations and everything, all, after all said and done, the families come to tell you, oh, you know what, we're no longer interested. We want to withdraw this case. We're Seriously? Not, yeah, we're, we're forgiven. Somebody yes. violates your child? Absolutely. We're forgiven. And I found that really ridiculous. And I always said to my um, officers, um, we don't withdraw cases of rape here. If they withdraw the cases, go ahead and file. If they don't show up in courts, fine. Then they can strike out the case. But go ahead and file these cases, you know, and at least make sure that the names of these perpetrators are Put, put up in our sexual offenders register, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I, I'd, always, I'd always been one to look out for women. When I was in Bielsa State, a lot of people didn't realize that I was instrumental to some of the appointments that were made, you know, concerning women, because I realized that most of the appointments were always about men. And I'll walk up to my governor, fantastic man, and I'll say to him, Your Excellency, what of the women? And he'll smile and, you know, say, yeah, I say, yeah, I mean, the men are, you know, just outnumber the women. And I know for a fact that women do very well. Um, four years ago, almost four years ago, when I marked my 50th birthday, I launched a book called Parenting in the 21st no, wait, Century. No, 50th. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I How? Launched, 
how? Yeah, I'm, I'll be 54 this year by God's uh, grace. No, no. <laughs> Are you guys seeing what I'm seeing? <laughs> this can be happening. A lot of people don't believe, you know. A lot of people actually think that in my like 30, 20, and 28, uh, yeah. 25. And when they see me, they get very angry that this small girl who is just in her 30s is a director general oh and is God. privileged to be a director general. So they don't oh understand that this small girl is older than a lot of governors and even some ministers. <laughs> So, yeah. So, yes, I launched a book called Parenting in the 21st Century. And then, um, trust me, this book, I wrote this book within three months. And um, this just was just telling you how to protect children generally mm -hmm. from being abused. I didn't even know God was preparing me for my job in NAPTIC. I had no idea I was going to be working in Naptip at the time, you know. And so I wrote this book on my, and launched it on my 50th birthday. And, you know, the job I do today is pretty much just like relieving everything I talked about yes. in my book, in how book. to protect and, you know, prevent um, all forms of um, violence from happening to your children. And, you know, each time I go to, you know, give out little talks, I give parents a tip because I realize that a lot of parents are very careless. Mm. You know, you send your children to school with a driver, you don't have an adult female, you leave your children at home with lessons teachers, no adult supervision, you send your children for holidays, wherever, and all of that. So many careless little acts that, you know, can be, you can be prevented, mm. you know. So, you know, I just you take time to educate people, to tell them things not to do, you know, concerning their children, whether be, be it a boy or be it a girl. So it's just something, it's just who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always been that kind of That's, person. Yeah. I want to know specifically, what are the challenges you face trying to execute this job, especially bringing back people from uh, people who were forcefully, you know, trafficked out or people who went on their own but are stranded and want to come back home? For now, because of COVID, lockdown and things like that, um, ex um, challenges of bringing them back, you know. But now the airports are open. And even before the airports were open, our federal government was working very closely with IOM and some of our development partners to bring them back. We're still bringing them back. Challenges are the fact that some of them may not want to give us information that would lead to the arrest of um, the perpetrators, because there are lots of perpetrators um, hanging around. Uh, those are basically the challenges of not having to get enough information. Some of them are so ignorant to the extent that they don't even know who trafficked them. They just mm. tell you, oh, it's one Papa Jimo or it's something. Like, oh, absolutely, it's one Papa Jimo and it looks like he has changed his phone number and things like that. Then, of course, sometimes we have challenges of, um, apart from bringing them back, we have challenges of... Um, interagency rivalry where for example another law enforcement agents agency rescues uh, victims and then um, arrest perpetrators rather than refer them to NAPTIP they display them on TV and start you know I mean that's so wrong rather than refer them so we can do our jobs you know so this interagency rivalry you know causes a lot of problem because with a job like ours we need maximum cooperation between all law enforcement agencies Definitely, because in my place, um, we say if we gather together and pee, it makes a lot of bubbles. So if we do that, <laughs> we'll get results. <laughs> now, if you're talking about gathering together and doing something, I know you had a collaboration with some UK uh, agencies, uh, the uh, UK Aid, uh, with the Not For Sale uh, campaign. You want to tell us uh, more about it? Yeah, we've had a lot of collaborations with so many countries, but really, um, UK has been one of our number one allies in the fight against human trafficking. Um, they came up with this um, communication strategy called Not For Sale. Um, the project took place in Edo and Delta states, and it was huge. It made a huge impact. Um, you know, we had um, former victim survivors come out to speak of their experiences, some that were trafficked, some that were almost trafficked, coming out to tell girls like them mm -hmm. that, look, it's not worth it. You don't need to go anywhere. I was trafficked, but I'm back. And look at what I'm doing today. I'm a baker. I have my shop. I'm doing very well. You don't need to go back. Some says, you know what? I was into painting, and someone tried to traffic me. But I didn't go, and here I, here I am today. You can likewise do the same. You don't need to go anywhere because you're not a commodity. Mm -hmm. We are not for sale because these guys don't mean well for us. 
they look at us as commodities and they sell us into slavery at the end of the day. So it was a very good communication strategy. It was a very good campaign that went very viral. It was all over the social media as well. We had the hashtag, I'm not for sale and all of that. So yeah, it was a very, very good and, and, and very successful campaign. You know, a lot of times when we um, talk about the children, uh, violation and all that, we lay a lot of emphasis on the girl child. Of course, we know they are vulnerable. But in one, more than one occasion, I've actually heard you say that the boy child is also vulnerable. I'm not um, contesting that, but I need, I need you to you know, explain more on that. You see, when you lay too much emphasis on something, you miss out a lot. Mm. So it's always good to balance it and look, you know, see between the lines. A lot of emphasis has been laid on girl child, girl child. But you're forgetting that they're boys as well. And then when you do not look closely at boys, you miss out a lot of things. They become very vulnerable. For example, you have a house boy at home and you say, I have only male children. So it doesn't matter. But you've refused to think that the houseboy may be bisexual hmm. or he may be homosexual. Hmm. And so you've exposed your boys to this guy because you're not paying attention on the boys. And so you don't ask questions that you should ask or ask questions that you will usually ask the girls because you think the boys are safe. And trust me, there are lots of abuses. Boys are being abused and on a daily basis. basis. So we need to look closely at our boys just as we look at our girls. We of course, um, somebody was telling me that um, if there's a lot of rape going on, it's because the women failed. And I was like, how did you get to that conclusion? He said, if the women had trained the boys well, I said, no, just say the parents failed. Because training is best done when it's together, which is why God did not assign it baby making to one person. But shifting base a little bit. Baby making, I know you have lovely children. Hello, mom. Hey. <laughs> Well, it would be wondering why I said that, because I know you have an Elizabeth in the house. Okay, so how does it feel, you know, being so busy and um, still being able to train your children? In all the while, I have known you for a while, from Biosat up until now, you have always been that uh, doting mother, and I keep wondering, how does she manage to keep the home front going, hmm. keep the office going, and still manage not to look tattered? It's very easy because I'm really not um, running after little children. I've paid my dues. My son is 29 years old. He's a grown man. He's working. Um, even buy me recharge cards. Are you um, kidding me? How does it feel? <laughs> very good. To have your child actually said, absolutely okay. fantastic. <laughs> and uh, my daughter is also grown. They are all graduates. They graduated so many years ago. Uh, my daughter is also a graduate. She's a musician. She's also she also read law, uh, but she's into music. And so I I don't really have babies to worry about you know my last child is 24 so i mean I, i'm just um, as free as the, the air <laughs> yeah and um, they are all on their own doing very well thankfully and then we talk um, as much as possible and we get together i was going to ask you that does he ever end being a mother you know does he ever end because the worries seem to get uh, bigger even as they get older it never ends, you know. I mean, a mother is always a mother. And I always tell my children, sometimes when they think mom is a little bit hard, I tell them you will always be my children. Even mm -hmm. when you turn 40, 50, 60, I'll always be your mother. And it is my responsibility to make sure I put you right. So from time to time, I have to call you. I have to ask how you're doing. I have to tell you what I don't like. I have to tell you what I like. You know, you need to put your children on the right track at all times. And when you call them, maybe probably there's, um, you have to pass this order. Why did you do this? How do they react as adults? They just laugh because they know, they know who I am. They know their mommy has come again. They just laugh. I mean, my son is so mature, he doesn't get angry at all. I have never seen anything like that. My daughter, yes, can get angry. Oh, mommy, blah, blah, blah. but my son will just laugh and say, you know what? Leave mommy alone. You know mommy. You know, so he understands me better. And uh, they just laugh at me, you know, and uh, they know that I, I mean well. They just know I mean well. That's you know? how you should and be. And I won't stop shouting anyway. No, don't ever stop. I don't like it or not. Don't ever stop because uh, the, the fear of mommy shouts yeah. is the beginning of uh, a certain kind of you know, wisdom. Yeah, yeah. You know? Then um, you, you talked about Elizabeth, who is uh, a musician. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth told me that for, for your leisure time, you pretty much 
Ah, on the dance field. Oh, wow. I love to dance. I've always loved to dance. Right from primary school, secondary school, I was the leader of the team, the traditional uh, group, um, primary, secondary, university. My friends just love to sit down and watch me dance. So you still dance up oh, until wow. now? I love to dance. Even in church, hmm. on Mother's Day, I dance. I love really? to dance. Yeah, I love. It makes me so happy. When I'm dancing, I am really, really happy. There are two things I do, or three things I do that make me very happy. When I'm cooking, when I'm exercising, and when I'm dancing. Those three things make Even me Even for COVID, I would have <laughs> given you a handshake. It looks like we have the same thing. I don't like to eat, but I like to cook. Me too. You know, so and it makes me happy. And yeah. when I'm cooking, yeah. I am... <laughs> yeah. So when I'm cooking, I'm also singing and dancing yeah. in the kitchen. It's fun. Yeah. Now, just before I leave you, I'd like to know, what would you say? Life is not always that smooth. I tell people, we look at a beautiful rose. It's beautiful, but surrounded it is always the thorns. You need to maneuver before you get to pluck the rose. What would you say, looking back, if you had a chance, you would have done it differently? More like regrets. Honestly, to be... Truthfully, truthful, I'm not sure I have much of regrets because um, I would have wanted to be a lawyer, but maybe along the line, I would have also done something I enjoy, um, like dancing. For yeah. professionally? Yeah, like dancing. I don't know <laughs> which musician is listening. Where, is, where are they? Don't yeah. just hear her. Like there dancing. is a potential dancer yeah. for you. Like you know? uh, a dance drama. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, I probably would have gone into acting, you know, to do like my law on the side and my dance drama on the side, which is not too late anyway, because for me, late. there's no age limit when it comes to acting or dancing. Definitely. So yeah, so I probably would have done that a lot earlier. earlier. But I really can't sit back and say, I have any regrets concerning anything. The only thing that made me so sad is the fact that I lost my mom, you know, mm. at an early age. Uh, but it's one of those things, you know, it and um, she didn't, I didn't have the opportunity to make her see the woman that she you raised, become. you know, yeah, because my mom is my role model, not any other person. My mom was extremely hardworking and she was very successful. So I always wanted to be successful. I always wanted to be like her and she was a very strong woman. My dad was a naval officer as well and you can imagine the discipline and everything. <laughs> my mom too was very strict, you know. So they both together, you know, they, 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 made, they, they brought me up in, in a way that I'm really excited about. But and I couldn't really do watch because my mom died very early and you know so that's just it but otherwise i'm not sure i can look back and say i had any regrets or i have any regrets whatsoever i'm not really sure about that you've actually done a whole lot of recording success you know on the book of uh, the golden book so to speak for success but then what would you say is your aha moment you know in the course of uh, doing your job especially with the nap tip for me, mm -hmm. when I get convictions, I'm excited. Mm. Yeah. It makes That's me, a lawyer. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It makes me so happy. In fact, I forget to eat. Yeah, I'm that happy. I'm that excited. When I get a conviction and my zonal commander calls me to say, we got a conviction, I am so excited. I mean, for me... The, 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 there's nothing. If you if you if you're a very good footballer like JJ back in his days, you can dribble from now to tomorrow. If you don't score a goal, you're on your there's own. Nothing. Yeah. So we can do everything we need to do: carry out awareness campaigns, go to court, arrest. But if we don't get a conviction, it's quite frustrating. So for me, that's just my moment. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Thank God I'm not a lawyer, because I'm not sure I want to convince anybody. <laughs> Just before I go, in a very brief moment, I'd like to know what is your philosophy of life? What would you want to be remembered for? I want to be remembered as somebody who worked very hard with all my power and my might and um, made a difference where I worked. I've always believed in hard work. That's my philosophy. Hard work determination and passion if you're passionate about whatever you do whatever you find yourself doing just grow passion for it become extremely passionate think about it dream about it eat it sleep it do everything you can you know put in your best 
With determination, hard work, and passion, the sky is your limit. I know that a lot of people who've watched and listened today, if you didn't pick anything, I mean, even if you didn't listen, you could see the body language. She didn't move a lot of her body, but you could see the passion as she spoke when she talked about hard work. Hard work pays, and you know, hard work the right way. Because um, that way, when you sit back to enjoy what you worked for, you survive it. You know, with joy, immense pleasure, because you know this is your work. All right, it's been the woman, and uh, we've been speaking for a while now with the Director General, National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Person. That's NAPTIP. She's grown and risen to this position. I know that you're going to even get better. Amen. We've been talking about women presidents. I want to see you at the Senate. I want to see you, you know, when is God's time also in Asura, because we need more people with passion and determination and hard work skill for it. All right, we'll be with you again next week. My name is Elizabeth Abai, and do join us for another special timeout on The Woman. Yeah.